Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by One Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Roberto J. Gonzalez, author of War Virtually, The Quest to Automate Conflict, Militarize Data, and predict the future. Released this April by the University of California Press. Roberto is president and chair of the San Jose State University Anthropology Department. He's authored four books, including Connect It, How a Mexican Village Built Its Own Cell Phone Network, and Militarizing Culture, Essays on the Warfare State. So the concept of virtual war raises all kinds of thoughts and questions in a layperson's mind. You know, is it virtual in the sense that war can happen in an alternate reality or is it the reality is just something that's happening that we don't know about you know is ai the future of i don't know justifiable murder or how do people in general feel about that and more specifically those soldiers presumably protecting what freedoms we have that are fighting or killing side by side with their next generation drones robots as well as information distortion and perversion that they have to deal with Couple that with our current circumstances, which just happens to be serendipitous. The war in Ukraine, you know, saber rattling between China and Taiwan. Who knows what we would do about that? North Korean forays into the nuclear playground and the threat of hypersonic missiles with trajectories so advanced and flat that 70 year old Minuteman missiles powered by DOS and five and a half inch floppy disks and telephones might not have a chance if they even pop up to stop these guys coming at us at Mach 5, pretty much horizontal to the ground. So we're dealing with autonomous weapons, robotic systems, predictive modeling software, advanced surveillance systems, psych ops, psy ops. So let's explore those scenario, uh, scenarios that Roberto contemplates and researches so deeply in the thoughtful, and as I said earlier to him, scary message about what may happen if we don't at least examine where warfare is taking us or where we're taking warfare. So welcome, Roberto, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you know, not really knowing where to start first, it may as well be drones. So let's talk about them and that'll lead us into the whole thing. Sure. Um, well, let me just back up a little bit and okay. say that virtual warfare um, means different things to different people. And so um, at the beginning of the book, I try to establish what I mean uh, with the concept of virtual war. And really for me, there are four parts to it. Um, one are um, robotic and autonomous weapon systems with drones uh, obviously being the centerpiece uh, of that in terms of modern technology or contemporary technology. Um, a second element is the area of cyber warfare and cyber defense. Um, the third area you alluded to earlier is, uh, I call it in the book, a form of 21st century high-tech psyops, psychological operations, which is really a new form of propaganda that's being used to sway the opinions of populations um, and uh, uh, entire societies. And then uh, the fourth element for me is uh, predictive modeling software, which we can get into a little bit later on. So let's talk about drones for a moment. Um, drones, you know, they've been with uh, the military for the US military and others uh, for more than 20 years now. And it's easy to forget that um, drones were deployed um, during the US invasion of Iraq, um, you know, in 2003. And so they do have a long history. They uh, have grown increasingly sophisticated and they've also, um, become in, very international. And, and what I mean by that is that there are many countries around the world now that operate uh, military drones and that manufacture them. Um, I'll just give one example. Um, one of the drones, drone models that's gotten the most attention lately is a Turkish made drone um, that I've heard referred to as the Toyota Corolla uh, of armed drones because they're so inexpensive, one to $2 million roughly, uh, depending on the features. And these are being used um, as we speak uh, by the Ukrainian forces um, against Russian troops and, and formations. So one of the, um, for me, frightening things about drones in, in particular is the fact that uh, basically the genie's out of the bottle and it's not just the US that has superiority in terms of uh, um, 
access to this technology. But um, you know, these are, are now widespread and commonplace around the world. Um, to make matters even more concerning for me, and I don't get into this so much uh, in the book, but it's, it's clearly, I think, going to be obvious to anyone who reads it, is that you know, there are these now very cheap commercial drones um, that you know, have been designed to, to do things like deliver pizzas across town or uh, ship Amazon packages uh, to your doorstep. Um, but imagine what might happen in a society that doesn't have regulations about the use of these commercial drones. Imagine if, um, if someone with, with malicious intent, a domestic terrorist, for example, uh, loads up a grenade on one of these commercial drones and, uh, and, and brings it to a school or to some other place where there are many people gathered at, at the same time. The, the, uh, the, the regulatory apparatus in this country and in many countries around the world is way behind in terms of regulating the technology. And that's something that I um, really try to emphasize in the book is that we're not powerless as citizens uh, to stand up to, to the development and deployment of these two new technologies or to the regulation of them. Um, and like in so many other things, I'm afraid that lawmakers are way behind the curve in terms of uh, dealing with the technology and uh, really uh, doing what, what, what they need to do to keep us safe. I know there's so many, you know, my son has a $1,500 drone it's and it's amazing to him. I was scared. I'm always saying, Michael, it's not going to come back. You're going to lose it. It costs us much money, but it knows what it's doing. And that's through AI. It says, oh my God, I'm almost to the point of no return. I better come back. And that's well, just 1500 bucks. Right. And I will say that the most significant thing, if we look at this sort of um, the, the uh, if you want to think of it as, as you know, the Mercedes Benz of drones, it would, it would be something like the US uh, used, the US manufactured Predator drones. Um, which uh, run into like a 20 to $25 million range uh, each. However, um, those you know, have the capability of, um, of being fully autonomous in the sense that, that, with, uh, that, that they can be operated pilotless, essentially. Um, and uh, although that has not really been used widely by the US military other than in experimental settings, the technology is there, and, uh, which makes it all the more concerning to me. Yeah, it's, what's interesting is when I first started reading it, I thought, oh, yeah, he kind of likes these things. And then gradually you realize it's like a clarion call to us about what's going on. And then I thought, you know, especially when you get to things like, and we can talk about this next, is like the drone, not the drone, but the um, autonomous vehicle, tank-like vehicle that they gave the funeral for in the 21-gun salute. And then the corollary letter, kind of letter, from the one soldier who said, you know, I hate this piece of crap. I can't believe what it's doing. And then what you were saying about total autonomy or even some guy out West, which we'll talk about too, who's just driving it like Ender's game, you know, not knowing who he's killing or why he's killing them. So yeah, that's why I'm scared. <laughs> yeah, let me say a few words. I did, um, I, I did intentionally hold off a little bit on the critique and try yeah, to introduce did. the technologies uh, because I, I, the last thing I want to do is come across as someone that is, uh, you know, a Luddite or just condemning the technology for its own sake or, or because of some political agenda. What I try to do, and I've got to admit, I'm, I, as I did the research for the book, I was fascinated by the kinds of technologies that have been developed and that are on the drawing board. Um, and it is a really seductive idea, this idea of virtual warfare, that somehow um, these technologies will somehow reduce casualties or uh, keep soldiers out of harm's way or uh, better yet, keep the civilians out of harm's way and just focus on, on the true enemies. Um, but the deeper I got into this, the, the more I realized that's really part of the public relations apparatus um, behind these technologies, which I do get into in the book. Um, I call it robo-fanaticism, this uh, kind of um, passion that many military elites have for these technologies. Um, but uh, what I do try to address in every chapter are the potential risks and hazards uh, for each of these technologies, and also uh, oftentimes the false claims that are made by the manufacturers or the military elites um, who are um, embracing this stuff. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you know, you can read Foreign Affairs Quarterly and uh, erudite scholarly articles about, well, actually in this month's Atlantic, there's an article about what is our nuclear strategy at this point. And I kind of get kind of pissed off because it's like with Trump and with the idiots who are now in power, 
does it really make any difference if someone writes an article in Foreign Affairs qu Quarterly? Like, for example, when is the next, next battleground going to be? And I don't mean to cut the book off at the legs, but when is the next time we are going to put boots on the ground? And if Putin decides to lob five kiloton bombs here and there, when is the next time we're actually going to be in a situation where we have people, 18-year-old kids, flying somewhere and parachuting or, or driving into a country to defend America? When will that happen again? I mean, this has nothing to do with your book, but it's something I think about all the time. Right. Well, I think one of the things that's common to all of the, the technologies that I'm talking about in the book, whether it's predictive modeling software, automated drones, um, even the robotic uh, technologies um, th that are operated by remote control, uh, the high-tech psyops uh, programs and manipulation of social media to sway public opinion one way or the other. Uh, what all of these things have in common is that they have consistently, gradually, but consistently over time, increase the distance between the person pulling the trigger or hitting the button and the person who receives it at the other end. And that's a really, uh, I think that is probably as good a definition of any for virtual warfare is yeah. this tendency and trend. Uh, I think of it really as a process that's years in the making now, decades in the making, that has gradually increased the, dip, the distance between, for example, uh, the drone pilot or the drone operator, the person actually pull, uh, pushing the, the button or pulling the trigger, and that uh, farmer who is a suspected member of the Taliban, you know, thousands of miles across the world in Afghanistan. And um, it's, I, I came across some pretty startling um, research in the course of doing this book. For example, I had always thought that drone pilots were um, analogous to video game, uh, someone playing a video game, uh, who was completely detached from the victim and who had no sense of empathy or humanity for the person at the other side. It turns out, and uh, you know, this has been, uh, this is some fantastic research that is being done by some anthropological colleagues of mine that have actually interviewed drone pilots um, and uh, folks in uh, places like uh, Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. And um, far from being, intact after going through this uh, process of drone warfare, many of these pilots wind up suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that was a, a shocker to me because I had never really considered the kind of internal stress that they're undergoing in the process of killing. And it turns out that they do get to know in some kind of bizarre sort of remote way, the person who the pilot winds up killing. The reason for that is because they're often spying on this person through surveillance cameras for days or even weeks at a time, following the person to the market, following the person to the mosque, following the person out into the fields, um, and uh, getting to get a sense of what this person's everyday life is like, albeit from a distance, and albeit without ever having the opportunity to talk with or meet with that person um, face to face. And uh, th there's a, a, an anthropologist by the name of Joseph. Uh, Joseba Zulaika, who's doing great work on drones as well. There's a number of us now that are, are really focusing our, our attention on these technologies. Um, and he describes uh, really the war in terror more generally as a kind of modern day form of witchcraft in where, where uh, military elites are trying to put this distance between the witches, in other words, the terrorists that on the other side, and um, in this case, US troops, as if somehow interacting with the so-called terrorists or the suspected terrorists would contaminate the soldier or maybe uh, poison uh, the soldier in some way. And that's an interesting kind of theoretical justification for the passion with which uh, the military brass have embraced virtual technologies in general and drones in particular. It's funny, what you were saying reminded me of the firing squads where they'd give one of the soldiers a blank so no one could feel responsible. There was always a chance that they didn't pull the trigger. And that reminds me again of Ender's Game, where maybe these guys would be better off if they were all playing a video game except for one. God, it's strange. Which also reminds me then of your definition of the reflective rather than the reactive soldier, which is fascinating. I never even thought about that, but, but it only comes into play. I mean, yeah, obviously it's a concept that we've all thought of, but it only comes really into play when you describe 
somebody running into battle with a, a bunch of different metal things, almost like a, a battle in Lord, uh, Lord of the Rings, where there's like five different creatures running along full tilt. But yeah, talk about that reflective versus reactive concept. Yeah, well, I think that, um, I mean, it's interesting because uh, one of the things that is part of the training process now for, uh, for infantry uh, troops, for example, is to destroy any sense of reflexivity on the part of the soldier. I mean, there's a very deep human aversion to killing other humans. I'm, I don't think it's instinctual, but I think it's deeply ingrained in humans, generally speaking. And it doesn't matter, I think, so much if that person's from another society or another culture or what have you. So I think part of the dilemma, part of the challenge that any military faces, whether it's ours or another country's military, um, or even paramilitary forces or non-state military uh, groups, is how to overcome that natural aversion to killing. And the way um, they do this, essentially, is through uh, things like rapid fire drills, um, these kind of dehumanized targets that will pop up. And what they're doing is training a kind of muscle memory into the soldier so that there is no opportunity to reflect, that you simply react and you do it quickly. So we're talking about sort of standard, you know, uh, um, uh, say World War II era type of, of fighting on the ground in a battlefield um, with a, 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 a rifle or, or uh, a, a, you know, a handheld uh, gun. Um, with the drone pilots, it's different, right? So they're, what's happening in their case is that they're actually having the opportunity to reflect because the surveillance process takes place over days. So I do think this is one of many dilemmas that the military trainers are facing in trying to create reactive soldiers when the technology, at least in the case of drones, is one that, that favors reflection because of the, the extended uh, time period. Um, that said, there is lots of work underway, I think, to break this down. And uh, I get into this, or at least allude to it, towards the, um, in the second half of one of my chapters, the chapter that focuses on robotic and autonomous systems, where I basically talk about um, what many military uh, elites, I think, perceive of as the big problem uh, with autonomous weapons. And it turns out that the big problem isn't so much with the technology from their point of view, the big problem is what they call the trust issue. And by that, they mean the lack of trust that many rank and file soldiers and pilots have towards the technology. So there's a real unwillingness to embrace the new technologies on their part for reasons I can get into um, if you want. But it's, it's not, you know, probably not a big surprise that these things often malfunction and often uh, uh, pose a threat to the soldiers themselves through friendly fire or fratricide, um, as, it's, as it's sometimes called. So um, there's, a, there's a real lack of trust from the rank and file soldiers and pilots and, and, uh, and sailors and so forth towards these technologies. So that from the military perspective, the real challenge is how can we get them to start trusting these autonomous systems? Um, and it turns out there's a lot of scientific research being done in this area, mostly by psychologists uh, who are working for the military laboratories. All of the big four branches of the military have their own uh, research laboratories, weapons labs. And um, I was surprised to find out as many social scientists working within them as there are. And many of them are focused on what they call trust calibration or uh, getting the soldiers to, to somehow set aside their mistrust of these machines. It's funny, I always think about, you know, I don't have a gun, uh, two reasons. If I'm reflexive, and I don't think, I'm not sure that I could shoot someone, they're gonna wrest the gun from me and shoot me. Or second, my son's gonna arrive unannounced, I reflexively shoot him. And, and that's what you talk about. You talk about a drone killing 23 family members and, and, and fratricide or, the guy who does write the email, which is actually poignant, um, talking about why he doesn't trust this piece of equipment. And so, yeah, when you get into the critique of this, why, you know, do you actually have this belief that this will never work? Do you believe that this deep, this deep delving into the concept of making people less adverse to, to shooting other human beings so yeah, it's a critique, but do you believe 
given the fact that you really bolster the fact that we're doing all this stuff and we're doing a really great job of it, do you believe we'll ever achieve the goal? And is it a goal worthwhile achieving? The, I, I don't, I basically leave that an open question <laughs> in, in the book. I don't come down on either side. And the reason is I've learned uh, over many years that, and I think many anthropologists feel the same way, that, um, that uh, like Yogi Berra once said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, so it's really difficult for me to say. Um, the re my, my initial instinct was to think this is a fool's errand. I mean, th this, they're never going to get soldiers to trust these technologies, given all the things that could potentially go wrong with them. And given the fact that there have been enough cases of friendly fire, um, one of the earliest was which the, uh, was the uh, what was called the Patriot frat fratricides. Uh, where some cruise missiles, this was during the early stages of uh, Iraqi freedom, I guess it was 2003, um, misfired or basically uh, deviated from the from course and uh, wound up killing uh, one British pilot and one American pilot that were in separate, uh, separate uh, jet fighters. Um, and from that point forward, I mean, I think there's been enough cases and close calls for there to be deep mistrust. And I think they've got their work cut out for them, those trust engineers, those psychologists working at the labs. That said, you know, as, as I've gotten more and more into the literature, I do acknowledge that, that the military, the US military in particular has done uh, some really fascinating work in terms of using psychological manipulation to overcome things like that aversion to killing through training exercises, through uh, the kind of killing technology that favors the sort of reactive side or our animal brains um, rather than our reflective sides. So for that reason, I decided it to leave it an open question um, and not, not uh, take a position on whether or not I personally think these things would be developed. I will say this, um, I, I, and I, this is jumping way forward to the conclusion of the book. I yeah. think we would all do a lot better uh, to be less awed and, um, and, and um, uncritical when it comes to these new technologies um, and jumping onto the bandwagon that we must do it because China might get there first, first or because Russia might get there first. And instead, I think we would do well to take a leading role in terms of thinking about really bolstering up our diplomatic skills as a society and, and putting more investment um, in the kinds of scientific research that's not so much focused on, on, um, on um, the hard sciences or physics and engineering and robotic technologies, but the social sciences and what they can tell us about um, how best to resolve conflict, about how best to promote demo, uh, diplomacy uh, and how best to make a safer world for us all. Uh, we can get into that later if you would like, but that's my, my own uh, position on it. Well, as an anthropologist, uh, two things. One, you have a react, well, you know, remember the movie Platoon and the guy's machine gunning out of the helicopter and the reporter photographer behind him says, you know, how can you kill young children like that? And he goes, well, you just have to lead them a little more. Th that's your classic reactive subhuman. And then today, the Secretary of Defense is doing joint military exercises in South Korea, uh, you know, pretending, in my opinion, that this is going to somehow affect the opinion and the motives of Kim Jong Un and saying, saying he needs to, it would, we need to stop the saber rattling and engage in diplomatic. So you know, he has no interest in listening to that. In fact, it makes it easier for him to make fun of us and incite us. So, you know, where do you go from there? I mean, I, you know, I try to pin people down and actually that's what I'm trying to do with you. I mean, you have all those other like errant kind of variables that as an anthropologist, you can examine, but what solutions could you possibly uh, expect us to believe with regard to that soldier in that helicopter or the fact that some North Korean madman is going to listen to us and watch us doing exercises in South Korea? That's where I'm trying to pin you, pin you down. Yeah, well, I mean, let's go back to drones for a moment, okay? I mean, I mean, I think when you put all your all your effort into trying to create more and more sophisticated drones that can then be used in, in more and more different 
uh, arenas around the world. Um, without thinking for a moment about how the drones themselves, instead of countering terrorism and killing terrorists, may actually be creating terrorists more rapidly. Yeah. You know, and um, so in the conclusion, one of the people that I cite is an anthropologist named Scott Atran, psychological anthropologist who's done fascinating work um, on the motivations of terrorists in many different countries around the world. Um, he basically sat down, continued sitting down, interviewing uh, people that, um, that were picked up on terrorism charges, um, and interviews them and, and has come up with um, a, an important insight, I think, into what motivates many terrorists around the world uh, and inspires them to, to uh, in oftentimes um, take their own lives. And it's not for religious, for re reasons having to do with religious fanaticism or ideological fanaticism, um, but he basically has the idea that it's mainly um, to, to create a sense of brotherhood or belonging that many of the disaffected people that engage in uh, terrorist attacks, uh, for example, in parts of the Middle East or Central Asia, uh, are actually seeking, in his words, the same kind of kinship or, or brotherhood um, as uh, someone who joins the Marines. Yeah, it's, it's not so much necessarily out of patriotism, but that sense of belonging and dedication and devotion. He calls it the devoted actor framework. Uh, now, this was not based on, you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of research. This was not the result of, you know, sophisticated, uh, algorithmically driven predictive modeling programs. This was just basic qualitative research, um, interviewing people, getting to know them, what's, what's, what makes them tick. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's really, it from, in my mind, that's, that's where we should be going uh, as a society. That's the kind of direction that the military and intelligence agency, agencies should be taking more seriously. And, you know, I'm not naive. I understand there's an entire military industrial complex pushing against that. And we can get into the role of Silicon Valley in the tech industry in, in a moment, which is another yeah. of the main themes of my book. Um, but I think that, that I mean, we're, we're kidding ourselves if we think that spending more or developing, uh, you know, smarter uh, or more autonomous technologies is going to solve the problem. Um, I, you know, I've, I've got to say it's, it may seem like going back a long way in history, uh, but it was only the 1940s and 1950s when uh, anthropologists actually had a seat at the table uh, when it came to um, U.S. foreign policy. People like Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson uh, played an important role, I think, in shaping uh, some of the post-war uh, uh, efforts in this country. Um, and I think that we anthropologists and other social scientists could play a, a really useful role if we did a better job of communicating what we've learned over the years um, with people in Congress, with people in the Pentagon, uh, with ordinary taxpayers. Um, and that's one of the main reasons that I wrote this book in the style that I did, which believe me, listeners, it's not an academic treatise. I don't think <laughs> you would describe it as that, um, but I very intentionally wrote it in a style that um, one of the reviewers referred to as science journalism because I very intentionally wanted to reach as wide an audience as possible uh, with this book, because I, I do care passionately about these things and think that, um, that we need to be better informed um, as a citizenry. Okay, let's go to the West Coast in a minute, but before to continue to do my, <laughs> proceed in my usual irritating fashion. If you, if you, as an anthropologist, you could go back to ancient Greece where you have these two gigantic armies in Troy, and they each pick a champion, one champion, and they go to the center of the gigantic field and whoever kills the other one, that's who wins the war. And I'm thinking, what if you had a drone war, like a clone war, where you have two massive armies, air forces of drones, and they just go out there and decimate one another, who wins and how do they win? They, have they taken the high ground? If you're eliminating the human being and you just use all this massive technology, couldn't you fight a war like that with, the problem is there's too many crazy people. That's the whole problem. <laughs> that is the problem, isn't it? I mean, that's, the, well, one of many, I guess, but yes, absolutely. And, you know, who's to say that, uh, <laughs> that it would be a fair fight? 
But I mean, I appreciate your example. I mean, what you're talking about is a duel, right? I mean, that's the classic duel. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned Margaret Mead's name uh, just a minute that's ago. Why, yeah. Um, but yeah, she has this wonderful article that she wrote, I think in 1940. And the title kind of says it all. The title of this article is um, Warfare is Only an Invention, Not a Biological Necessity. And in this short piece, she takes on the idea that somehow, which is still common, commonplace, the idea that somehow war is, is a part of human nature. And therefore, why should we imagine a world without war? Now, Margaret Mead, as I would, fully acknowledge that violence may well be a part of, of, human, uh, of human nature, right? I mean, there's always been violent conflict among humans. But warfare represents uh, a kind of radical escalation of the scale and scope of conflict so that it involves uh, in every modern war, civilians, increasing numbers of civilian casualties oftentimes, um, not to mention um, the, the, the folks in the military uh, that, are, that are getting uh, killed as well. So what Mead suggests is we need to think about other alternatives you know, that would reduce the scope of conflict or the scale of conflict. And I appreciate the example of, of ancient Greece uh, and, and you know, having the, the two uh, individuals go at it. Uh, and the idea of drones, I've got to find, you know, I, I think that's, that's pretty cool too. But as you say, there's a lot of crazies out there and there's no guarantee that people are gonna follow the rules either. And what you're saying always triggers something else. And I'm thinking of the first scene in 2001 where you have these two competing, well, they're not competing yet until the artifact says, hey, you know, this bone could be used as something else. And then he starts smacking it. And then he realizes, wait, I can protect my source of water. I can protect my clan. And isn't that what war is all about anyway? Is, aren't we high? Okay, Margaret Mead says no, but I'm saying that makes it seem as if we're hardwired for this, you know? Well, um, it, and you're an anthropologist. It, but yeah, I think that all one needs to do is come up with a counterexample of a society that's decided we're not going to engage in or what Margaret Mead and I, along with her, define uh, war as essentially um, organized conflict. So organized conflict against a, an enemy. So um, it, that is it does go way back. And there's plenty of hunter gatherer societies, um, you know, going back thousands and thousands of years that accepted the concept of war and used it. Uh, frequently, but not all. Uh, and so what Margaret Mead does in this, in this example, and, and anthropologists have uncovered a lot more since then, is look at societies that um, have limited the scope of conflict in one way or another. My favorite uh, is what Mead calls, uh, you know, the Eskimo case, which we would now call Inuit in, in, among anthropologists. Um, but essentially, uh, for certain kinds of conflict, they actually have singing com competitions. <laughs> so, so rather than killing each other historically, anyway, uh, the Inuit engaged in singing contests. And in other cases, they had a, a form of duel that was um, basically took the form of headbutting. So you would just slam into the, the the opponent's head until one of you just collapsed and couldn't go on any further. Um, and so this was culturally accepted. And so I'm not suggesting that we do that, but I'm suggesting that we use that to think optimistically and creatively about other alternatives that we might invent um, that would get us away from the direction uh, of war and mass killing. Okay, I promise you we'll go to Pentagon West. I promise you. The last thing is, is I think of longhorn steers or antelope. They don't kill each other. They just use their semi-ornamental appendages to establish who's dominant enough so that the, they can have sex <laughs> with the right partner. Um, okay, I'll stop. Let's go out Pentagon West. And a good way to start would be, since we're talking about ancient cultures would be, because it's fascinating the way you've talked about, it. I listened to one of your interviews, how you talk about data and datum and how it originally originated and what it really meant. Because I'm thinking, holy mackerel, I had no idea. I never thought of that. Yeah, so um, I'll, let me talk about that. Uh, the word data comes from the um, ancient Greek word datum, uh, which essentially means that which is given. Um, in other words, a gift, <laughs> literally. Uh, and so this, is, this was brought to my attention um, by an anthropologist who's also uh, a well-known journalist, Jillian Tett. She's the editor of Financial Times newspaper. 
And um, she had a short column in which she talked about the history of the term. Um, and the relevance here is that um, I think it does help us explain some of the conundrums that revolve around data. So uh, for example, if data is a gift, uh, if we think about the kinds of data that we give to a social media company like Facebook or Twitter, uh, that personal information is literally a kind of gift that we're giving uh, to the companies in exchange for, uh, I suppose, what many of us might think is a free service, uh, the platform uh, for communicating. Um, and so that I, I thought that was an interesting thing to think about, just to recognize the etymology of the word and, and think more deeply about uh, how the definition has changed um, over the course of, of the last few centuries. Um, of course, now data typically refers to um, a very, at least in the United States, it's a very narrow kind of definition or information that can be uh, digitally stored and transmitted. And now, of course, we hear about big data um, all the time. Uh, but this does get us into um, the question of the role of the technology industry. So not just the social media companies, um, but also um, the tech companies in general. Um, so this would include, uh, I, I mentioned quite frequently in the book, the role of Google and Amazon uh, and Microsoft and the increasingly tight um, relationships between these companies and others um, that are focused uh, on, on, high, on big tech um, and the Pentagon and intelligence community uh, as well. There is this kind of um, portrayal of Silicon Valley in much of the media as somehow being fundamentally opposed or at odds uh, with the Pentagon uh, in terms of the philosophy, the work ethic, uh, the kind of cultural norms. Um, but what I argue in the book is whatever differences exist really are largely superficial, um, but that um, the Pentagon has a very vested interest in supporting uh, the tech industry and the tech industry from its very beginnings has been very reliant upon funding from uh, military and intelligence agencies, first for its birth and for its development and for its future. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that struck me, the way you portrayed it was good. You go, okay, we're out here in Silicon Valley. It's a lot easier to get to Hawaii than it is to get to DC. And then I thought about it, but, and you're also talking about information. Information flows instantaneously now. And I think, you know, I've looked at my life and you've looked at your life as, gathering as much information as you can is probably a really good purpose for living, but it's also a really good purpose for, for perfecting war. And in addition to Silicon Valley, Google, metadata, meta the company, there's always the, the, the problem that is posed by say, and you talk about it, Cambridge Analytica. And uh, what's the other one? I keep thinking Saturday Night Live, but it's SSCL, right? Uh, SCL group, or C, uh, SCL group, yes, um, Strategic Communication Laboratories. Yeah, those two, I mean, those are the scariest of all to me because they're essentially unmonitored. It can happen at any time, and it does. I mean, it happens to companies in, in the private sector, the public sector, and, and, and this way it's happening to the world. So... Yeah, be, yeah, we'll go back to uh, what's happening in Silicon Valley because that's just as scary. But what about Cambridge Analytica? For, because you know why? Because everyone knows what it is. Pr pretty much everyone knows kind of what happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Cambridge Analytica got a, a huge amount of attention, obviously, uh, with the, um, with basically the, I think it was 90 million, uh, you know, Facebook users whose data had been um, turned over to the company and um so the, I think Cambridge Analytica in the minds of a lot of people, they're going to remember it as um, the company that might have helped Donald Trump win office because of the targeted messaging that they sort of orchestrated on behalf of his presidential campaign. Um, uh, however, the side of Cambridge Analytica that I delve more deeply to um, in a chapter of my book is its connections to SCL Group. So SEL groups a lot less known, I think, among average, uh, you know, media consumers here in the United States. SEL group was, um, it was a firm that was founded um, in the late 1980s in the UK, so it's a British firm. Um, they started out off as a kind of a marketing consultancy and then uh, got more and more involved in essentially psyop, psychological operations. 
uh, and basically sold their services to uh, military and intelligence agencies around the world. Um, and they, uh, by their own account, had uh, basically been involved in more than um, in hundreds of um, political campaigns, uh, basically managing political campaigns and advertising in something like 70 countries around the world. I mean, th their reach was uh, stunning. Um, SCL Group eventually um, wanted to get into the US market but US election laws don't allow for foreign firms to serve as political consultants. And so they created essentially a, a shell company, Cambridge Analytica, uh, here in the United States to compete against other political uh, consulting groups because it's, a, it's you know, increasingly it's a, it's a hot uh, market and there's a lot of business. Um, and so that really is the sort of backstory of Cambridge Analytica is that it's really rooted in a history of um, PSYOPs and, SC, and uh, it's got that direct connection to S or it had before it was disbanded. It had that direct connection to SCL Group, um, which was essentially a military contractor. And these guys are so powerful, but it's funny because I remember an article, it might have been in the New Yorker or maybe Harper's, where they were talking to some kids, teenagers from, it may have been Ukraine, it may have been some other country, but they were saying to them, so what are you going to do? this disinformation campaign, what are you gonna do when it's over? I go, well, we'll just move on to sports or something like that. And it was like, so cavalier. It was just something they could do. Yeah, I mean, that is the, um, to me, one of the, the most worrisome parts about this. I mean, you don't need a lot of money <laughs> to, get in, to get in the game, you know? Um, and uh, I think what Cambridge Analytica had going for it were the connections. Um, I mean, they, they were, they had uh, people like, uh, uh, Robert Mercer on their board and, you know, very um, influential, uh, oh. uh, you know, Trump allies basically were, um, were connected to, to Cambridge Analytica and that helped it out. But I mean, yes, you're right. I mean, it, it, all you need is basically a, an internet connection um, and you're, you're, you're ready to go. And there've been plenty of profiles of these types of, of internet wizards um, in major uh, newspapers, I think, for us to get a sense of of how easy it is to get started and, and to do this sort of manipulation. I think if you're missing the kind of regulation that I think we really desperately need in this country, these kinds of, of episodes are, are inevitable. They will continue happening into the future until, until there's serious regulation and reform. Self-policing, yeah, expecting Meta or Facebook or Twitter to self-police to self themselves, that's not gonna work. It's funny because you said starting up and it reminds me of how much time you spend on actual startups and how they play into this whole thing, not only for their excitement that they're making money, but go, go back. Let's go back to Silicon Valley and talk about that. Sure. Um, one of the things that I uh, learned in, in researching the book is that um, so I've got a chapter called Pentagon West and the, the basic argument is that um, we should stop thinking of Silicon Valley and the tech industry more generally as somehow apart from or distant from the Pentagon, that really we should, we would do well to think of it more as a, uh, a military outpost, as kind of a, as a key research and development center that operates not solely for, but, it, but very closely with the needs of the Pentagon, the CIA, um, you know, and, and other members of the intelligence community. Um, a part of that, and I delve more really deeply, I think, in, into two um, organizations that are connected with the Department of Defense on the one side and the CIA on the other. Uh, and those two are one, what's called DIU, um, Defense Innovation Unit. So it's literally, there's an office building less than a mile away from the Googleplex, from Google headquarters, um, that's got about 40 or 50 um, basically military staffers that whose sole job is to go out and hunt for startup companies that are developing technologies that might benefit the Pentagon in some way that might advance in particular their kind of virtual warfare uh, technology. So they're out scouting for startup um, robotics companies, uh, surveillance companies and things like that. Um, uh, companies that are developing body monitors, uh, fitness tracker type devices that uh, could be uh, adapted for, um, for use on the battlefield or by uh, military personnel. 
So startup funds, you know, as your listeners, I'm sure will know, they're, de- they're often desperate for startup cash. They need cash to keep going and to, to get the technologies uh, developed and to market. And it's also very cutthroat. It's competitive um, out here in Silicon Valley because there's lots of these that, ha- that are flourishing and a very small number of them actually succeed. So um, the Pentagon established the Defense Innovation Unit about six, about seven years ago, and uh, they've been very active and they have pumped uh, at this point now, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into firms um, in the Valley. Most of them you would not recognize by name uh, because they're very small, sometimes with maybe five employees. Um, Others are quite well-known companies. The CIA, it turns out for about 20 years now, has had something very similar called InQtel. And it's the same premise. Uh, It's basically a startup uh, incubation fund that the CIA has set aside um, with um, basically targeting uh, tech companies that are developing in the case of uh, the intelligence community, they're really focused on surveillance uh, kinds of technology, surveillance drones, um, uh, advanced satellite uh, systems and things of that sort. So um, it's, I mean, to me, you know, San Jose State where I teach is smack in the middle of Silicon Valley. I've been teaching for 21 years and I had no idea of what DIU or NQTEL were until I started researching this book. I mean, I've been interested in militarization as kind of a cultural phenomenon for more than a decade, but it's not until I started looking at high tech forms of warfare that I had any clue that these kinds of investments were being made. Um, so to me, part of the, the, the audience for this book, I hope, will be people working in Silicon Valley who may unwittingly be doing contract work for the military without even recognizing it. Um, I develop, a, or I, I should say I use um, the concept of dual use technology in talking about how Silicon Valley fits into the Pentagon's uh, you know, uh, long-term picture. And, and I, I state that oftentimes the most advanced military technologies uh, are du- have been dual use technologies that were once civilian technologies, but then adapted for military use. And a great example of this are virtual reality headsets, um, which, you know, have, which have been developed by the tech firms, I think, you know, years ago, I think largely with gaming in mind to start with, but also other applications. Um, but Microsoft's uh, VR headset uh, really caught the attention of the US Army and um, probably Amazon, uh, uh, Microsoft's largest um, uh, client in terms of these VR headsets is the US Army. They have an order for have more than 100,000 of these things out. Um, and this actually led to protests within the company, not a huge number of Microsoft employees, um, but as I understand it, a few hundred were not very happy and let management know, let the, uh, the executives at the company know that this isn't what they signed up for. Uh, and I do spend some time in the book talking about what I call uh, these very uh, nascent um, resistance movements within the tech industry. I'm encouraged very much by some of the criticism that's emerging from within Microsoft, within Amazon, uh, within Google in particular. And uh, I think more of that is likely to spread um, as the connections grow tighter between big tech and big military or big defense. I can personally remember back in the 60s and during Vietnam, you know, these SDS and students on campus that were occupying the president's office, you know, they determined, you know, they wanted to go against uh, fight ROTC at the universities, allowing ROTC, and then they would find laboratories where the military was experimenting on animals, and they would let the animals out of their cages and open the doors. One, it didn't really accomplish anything, but who now, even if you have this nascent belief, and I know you're open-ended, and I'm still trying to paint you feebly into a corner, um, what if the what if there is this little uprising, just like letting the animals out of the lab? I mean, it didn't accomplish anything. Isn't it so? Isn't this military industrial complex fact, which is now factorial, isn't it so strong that you and I or a group of you and I's can't possibly touch it? Isn't it such strong armor like in like in a neuromancer? Isn't it such strong armor that we can't go against it right now anyway? Well, I think it's important to step back. And I think that 
those of us who have been critical of a militarized society like our own and an industry like the military industrial apparatus that has been so influential over so many years, sometimes we forget that they're not actually the most powerful companies in America or in the world. In fact, I would argue that Amazon is stronger than any of the major defense contractors. And part of what it just in terms of sheer value uh, of the company, uh, and not to mention their capacity to surveil, <laughs> to engage in surve surveillance of many kinds, um, to understand us as individuals uh, in terms of how we behave online. Um, they're extremely powerful uh, economically, politically, and I would argue even uh, culturally uh, in the society. I uh, and I, so I think that part of the reason it's really important to focus on the people working for companies like Amazon or Google or Microsoft and all of these companies, again, in terms of their value uh, in economic terms, their economic power, um, are it, it's awesome. It, uh, even when compared to the Lockheed Martins of the world um, or the Raytheons of the world. So for me, I think if you see yourself as an activist or, or a reformer of some kind or someone who just wants to bring about a more peaceful society, I think it's important to maybe focus on the right target. And here I think an important target are those tech workers that could potentially make some kind of a difference. And it's happened already. I mean, if you think about what happened at Google when a secret contract was signed or was uh, agreed upon by the executives at that company with the Pentagon to do artificial intelligence analysis of drone footage in Afghanistan. When the workers found out, some of them quit. Many of them reached out to the media. It was front page, a front page story, at least in the tech media, for weeks and weeks. And it led to um, some really, I think, creative ways of engaging in deeper critiques and, and uh, political action against these kinds of um, alliances between big tech and big defense. The one example I'll cite is the example of, and I mentioned him by name in the book, a former uh, chief scientist at Google by the name of Jack Polson, who later called himself a conscientious objector, quit Google. I'm sure he was making loads of money, um, but he, on principle, he said, I want no part of this. Uh, and he stepped away, created a nonprofit called Tech Inquiry, which is doing great research on the contract that uh, the Pentagon uh, and the CIA are giving to tech firms of all kinds. And this is publicly available information that he and his researchers have hunted down and condensed into reports that are available online. That's one person that said no, that pushed back and, and now potentially, I think, can get an audience in the Congress, sympathetic congressional staffers, I think are, are the next step for groups like Tech Inquiry or researchers for myself, like myself. Uh, I think what's needed are congressional hearings in the same way that the con uh, there were congressional hearings on nuclear weapons, um, you know, a generation ago. So, uh, or more, I guess now, but um, to me, <laughs> I decided I needed to write this book to go back to Jack Polson when I spoke with him on one occasion and he told me the connections are so much stronger than you realize. He said, imagine Amazon with its vast financial resources one day deciding, deciding that they wanted to acquire Raytheon. So to me, that's the, that's the bigger concern. Not, not so much like how can we go up against the military industrial complex, but when the big tech firms start swallowing up the big defense firms, how can we make sure that there's some kind of a check on that? And what kind of, a, by us, I mean the activists or those that are just simply concerned, concerned citizens. Um, and who are, those, um, who are those allies that are already within the industry that we might be able to rely on to do the right thing? And just to finish up on the Google note here, they did, those protesters, even though it was only a few hundred of them, actually it was a few thousand that signed the petition uh, for the, basically, uh, demanding that the CEO pull out of the contract. Um, they actually had an impact. The, Google did in fact not renew their contract. There were some, you know, proviso. So they said, we're not gonna do no military work, but we're simply not gonna work on any more weapon systems. 
that's something, you know, that's a reform. Um, and they also created a code of ethics for the first time ever, which they didn't have. And I think they really politicized uh, a good number of people within the firm uh, that would otherwise have had no interest at all in any of these issues, but really felt betrayed uh, by the company leaders when this uh, came to light. I should mention, this is called Project Maven for your listeners that might wanna research this. It's been quite a few years since this scandal broke, but the, um, that Pentagon contract went by the name of con uh, Project Maven. And I've come to learn also that Google was a relatively minor player in the contract, that actually Microsoft got a much bigger piece of the Project Maven pie uh, than Google, um, although that didn't come to light until some time later. Who knew? Oh God, it's so funny because as you may know, as a bookstore owner, these are like the best books to sell because, and, and we have all these book clubs. It'll, so it's like, you just gave me a sandwich. First, you gave me cautious optimism. Then you gave me Armageddon. Then you gave me back cautious optimism again. And so what'll happen in the book club is, which I call a fight club, is <laughs> you'll have people on either side of the table arguing, okay, so is he saying this or is he saying this? And how, how dare he say this? And it's, it's a great way to sell a book. I don't mean it that way, but it's a great way to sell a book that's very eminently readable. So I guess in conclusion, I'm going to try and once again, irritate you. And as in my Jeremiah of an introduction, okay, step outside your book, if you will. When again, are we ever going to, <laughs> I can't stop. When, when again, are we ever going to put guys on the ground, guys and gals, gals can't say that either. When are we going to put men and women on the ground, and when are we going to be able to come up with a strategy that would stop essentially the end of the world? I mean, once Putin decides, if he does decide whether he's sick or whether he's basically a serial murderer or has a bunker underground that's like a stately um, Kublai Khan, you know, labyrinth, uh, I know it's outside the purview of your book. Just <laughs> what do you think? I mean, are we ever going to be ever, are we ever going to send some soldiers somewhere again? Would America tolerate it? Unfortunately, I, I think so. I mean, <laughs> at least for the foreseeable future, that's just my gut sense. And I, I say that, you know, having observed what's happened uh, tragically uh, with, the, with the recent occupations, you know, of Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, one of the uh, unfortunate things I think about um, the society that we're living in about our country is that we do have a tendency to forget things very quickly. Um, I heard someone uh, once describe the United States as the United States of amnesia because within a few years, um, so many of us tend to forget so quickly um, some really horrific realities and, um, and then somehow just make the same mistake all over again. And, um, you know, to me, I never give up, however, because I spent um, two years of my life in a small indigenous village in the state of Oaxaca, Southern Mexico. And there people talk about events that might've happened 100 or 200 or 300 years ago, as if it happened last week. So, you know, amnesia is not necessarily a part of the human condition. Um, but for some reason, we're in a society um, that tends to do that. And I, part of the book does get into history, not necessarily a thousand years or 2000 years of history, but history going back to the early 20th century or to the World War II period or to the Vietnam era, to Vietnam War era, because I am convinced there are important lessons that we should have learned as a society at those times about what happens when military technologies are allowed to run amok. And that was really a driving factor um, behind this book. I, I don't know if I, if I addressed your question or if I, I'm still pinned down, but that was a tough one. So I appreciate, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, yeah, and the thing about what made, that made me think of is when you said the United States of Amnesia is like, you know, every day from a Google, my Google news feed, if it actually is a real news feed, you know, you get CNN, day 100, Ukraine. And we're, I think we're beginning that fatigue right now with them. And that's really, really scary. And yeah. All right. Well, so I'll, I'll let you be now. 
And um, thanks so much for coming on, Roberto. Uh, the book is great. And, um, you know, it's been out since April, and we have it on the front table in our bookstore, and we'll continue to do so. And, um, and like I said, I, I'm pretty sure it'll be one of our book, uh, book club picks. So thanks again for joining us today. I really appreciate the invitation. I had a great time talking with you, um, even if the subject matter was pretty dark for most of the conversation. And um, I really hope people will will talk about these things and and disagree with me or disagree with with the ideas. But I think the important thing is just to be aware that that these things are happening around us. Yeah, and I think you did so very well, honestly. Thank Thanks you. Again. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Bye bye. Bye bye.